Carmine, you're very welcome to the Scale Axe Insider Podcast. I'm really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you, Brendan. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to listeners who are real learn-it-alls instead of (laughs) know-it-alls. They all have a growth mindset and they are the perfect audience for this type of content. They absolutely are. Our listeners are very learned and certainly learn-it-alls. So, We've been chatting off air. You know, our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of of small to medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So what does scaling with purpose mean to you, Carmine? When it comes to a definition of scaling with purpose, I am going to quote the great John Doerr. John Doerr is a famous venture capital investor in Silicon Valley, where, where I am. And he was the first major investor, the first professional investor in Amazon. He also invested in a company you might have heard about called Google. He's done very well for himself. So the billionaire, John Doerr, who I interviewed last year, told me something I'll never forget, and it applies directly to scaling a company. He said, Carmine, ideas are easy. Execution is everything. Most of the problems that matter, that are worth achieving, take more than a lone inventor and a scientist to solve them. They require the actions of a team, a group of people, and people are inspired by leaders. We need leaders who are great communicators and great storytellers. And that's why I took a deep dive into Jeff Bezos, Uh, for this new book, The Bezos Blueprint, which thank you for interviewing me early on it. But I spent three years on this because here's a man who scaled from zero to one of the world's most valuable companies. And that's why I reached out to you immediately because I knew that this content is ideally situated for small and medium-sized business owners whose goal is to scale and grow. Brilliant. I love that. And John Doerr is someone who, again, I'm, I'm passionate about. His wonderful book, Measure What Matters, is, uh, forms part of our program material. And that's terrific. A, OKRs. Indeed. <laughs> and that's a quote that actually we have requoted in our own book. So uh, it's like I teed you up for that, Carmine. But I, we, we're going to dive into your, your new book as the as the podcast progresses i first came across your work through your wonderful book talk like ted Mm -hmm. but how did you become a communications guru essentially you've you've devoted your life to this now so clearly you see the importance of communications so can you share with our audience a little bit of that background please And what's fascinating is that although I've written 10 books, I am always improving as a writer and I'm always learning something new, which is why I enjoy doing podcasts like this, because I learn something from you and from your listeners. Uh, I guess I should start by saying everything we're going to discuss today, or actually maybe I should save this till the end, but no, I'll start. (laughs) Everything we're going to discuss today are advanced communication techniques. Communication and persuasion is is hard if you are going to do it well and to separate yourself from the pack, to go from where you are today to where you see yourself in the future. It takes creativity. It takes practice. It takes work. Uh, That's why it's really important to understand the tools and strategies that people like Jeff Bezos have, have pioneered at Amazon or strategies that other great speakers use and other great leaders. So I wrote Talk Like Ted, which became a very popular public speaking book around the world uh, because I wanted to identify those techniques that make those TED Talks so engaging and so interesting and impressive. There is a formula to those TED Talks, but it's a formula that goes back thousands of years. And that's what I tried to unearth and I tried to reveal through my through my writing for example storytelling well storytelling is an ancient device aristotle was one of the first uh, greek philosophers to say that stories connect human beings with one another so that was more than 2000 years ago we are wired to be storytellers and that's why most ted talks begin with someone ex- articulating their personal stories stories connect us with one another and we are wired 
to respond and to connect with people through story. So some people will say, oh, yeah, the TED Talks, they always start with a story. So formulaic. I disagree. It's not formulaic. It's the way our brains are wired to communicate. Yeah. And just on that point of storytelling, how important is it when leaders are actually crafting their vision and communicating that vision to couch that vision in the form of a story and maybe you can share some data behind that in terms of how we learn you know versus just a presentation for example where there's stats and uh, versus the actual sure. enshrinement of your vision couched in in the form of a story i'll share data first and then i'll give you a story McKinsey, the giant uh, consulting firm, came out with a study this year, so not too long ago, several months ago, and they looked at 18,000 business professionals around the world in about 130 countries to identify those habits, those skills that they call future-proofing a career. So someone who wants to build a career for themselves, what are the skills they need? In most of those surveys, I always expect communication to be number one or two. I'm sure you've seen that. Mm -hmm. Got to be a good communicator. Okay. But what does that mean exactly? This is the first time I saw a survey that specifically cited storytelling as the skill to future-proof your career. Storytelling. So what does storytelling mean? It, it, it's not just, let me tell you a story about what happened on, on the way to the podcast today. It's identifying those stories from your personal life, from a case study or a customer story, if you're a small business owner, that is relevant to the audience in which you are speaking to. A story that will connect with them on a deeper level than facts alone and move them to action. Years ago, I was in a conversation with the CEO of Y Combinator, in Silicon Valley, a lot of people know about Y Combinator. It's a seed investor that early on invested in companies that you might have heard about. One's called Airbnb. They turned out to be fairly successful. If it wasn't for Y Combinator, you don't have Airbnb. You don't have Reddit. You don't have Dropbox and many others. So I'm speaking to the CEO who just recently retired from being the CEO of, Red, of uh, Y Combinator. His name is Jeff Ralston. And you can find this uh, video on YouTube. I'm speaking to Jeff and I made a mistake. I made the mistake of saying storytelling is a soft skill. And I, and I even apologized. So here's the guy who's written a whole book just on storytelling, and I'm apologizing for myself. I said, Jeff, I'd, I'd like to talk to you now, not just about entrepreneurship and leadership, but something that's very relevant. It's a soft skill. Let's, let's talk about storytelling. And Jeff stopped me, and he looked at me, and he goes, well, you call it soft. I call it fundamental. A and he, he corrected me. And I'll never forget that. I was a little embarrassed, but it was such a good learning because he said, when you have a, a new service, a new company, a new product, and now we're speaking to all of our small and medium-sized business owners who are listening, when you have something new or different, it's imperative on you to bring people along on that journey, whether it's an investor, partner, employees, how you articulate the story behind that product or service is everything. You have to be the storyteller in chief, the person who is going to convince others to join the journey. And that's why he said, you say it's soft. I, I say storytelling is fundamental. Yeah. So I'll quote Jeff Ralston at Y Combinator. Storytelling is fundamental. Very compelling. And there's something that you said at the outset about your customers and the importance actually you alluded to it and i just want to pick up on it because proposition is the seventh principle of our scale x framework and the importance of actually articulating your proposition but getting your uh, customers to tell the story of why your product or service has brought them value should we uh, you know have you any advice for our listeners, Carmine, in terms of 
helping to instruct our customers to become evangelists and storytellers about our product and service? Yes, it takes a, a leader to reimagine the role that they play and their team. Storytelling is collaborative. I suggest that all leaders think of themselves, especially in a small company, as the storyteller in chief. Otherwise, no one else is going to be a storyteller. Yeah. They don't quite understand what it means. Yeah. You are the one who's out there talking to customers, who's traveling, meeting new people, understanding the market needs. There's a story everywhere. There's a story about a customer who had a problem. Your service or your company solved that problem in a way that no other company can. It's a differentiator. Take, take that story. Ask that particular person for a photograph, a quote, maybe even a video. Use, gather those assets, use them on your website, use them in product pitches because people are, are connected to story, not just to the facts of your product. They want to know how the product solves their problems. And the best way to do that is to show them through the stories of others. I've noticed something that Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has started to do in his last several uh, product launches. And I think it's a little shtick, and I kind of like it. It's called Dear Tim. So he doesn't start by introducing the new products, whether they're a new Apple Watch or a, a new iPhone. He begins by Dear Tim. And every day, he reads about a 1,000 emails. And he'll find those emails that people have uh, sent to him that resonate with him in some way about a product. And that's when he will take that email, delegate it. If you're a small business owner, it's up to you. But he'll delegate it to someone who can then gather the assets. So they will reach out to that customer. They gather assets. They take video. They'll interview the customer. And they create a little pre-production that Tim uses to launch uh, into his new product presentations. Yes. And, he, and he'll start with, dear Tim. And what he does in this last one, um, a while ago when he introduced the uh, new iPhone 14, he starts with, dear Tim. And the video cuts to people reading their letter different people reading their letters. And they're usually heartfelt stories or stories of how an Apple watch may have saved their life. They didn't realize they had an Apple watch and they were in a, one was in a plane crash, you know, very dramatic stories. Your, your stories may not be that dramatic, but you see what he's doing. He is going beyond just the, he learned this from Steve jobs. He's going way beyond the product itself to showing you through the stories of his customers, how that product will enrich your life. That's the difference between a leader and a manager and a leader storyteller. So think of yourself as the storyteller in chief, regardless of the title you have. Yeah, that's great advice for, for everyone listening. And, and I always move beyond the the features and benefits of the wonderful product that you have or service that you offer and and uh, capture the stories of the customer and even better as you've alluded to carmine get the customer to to tell the story about the value of your product and service and how it has enriched their lives either you know brought again or solved the pain i'll give you another anecdote very quickly uh you may have heard of him, maybe had him on the show. Uh, Tony Fidel, who is a former Apple executive, who is the considered the father of the iPod. So he created the iPod and then the hardware for the iPhone. Uh, and then he went on to start a company called Nest, which he sold to Google for $3.2 billion. He did very well for himself. He was on a podcast recently, and they asked him, what is the one thing you learned from Steve Jobs? And he said, I'll give you three. Storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. Brilliant. So if you ask me why storytelling, that's why storytelling. Yeah. And I, I love it. it. It's a lovely segue to a wonderful quote in, in, in one of your books previously. Ideas are the currency of the 21st century. Your ability yeah. to persuasively champion your ideas is the single greatest skill that will give you a competitive edge. I love Thank that. So, Thank you. Carmine, diving into your wonderful new book, 
Uh, what inspired you to write it about Jeff Bezos after writing books on Steve Jobs and indeed on TED Talks, as we alluded to earlier? Let me quote the great biographer, Walter Isaacson. I think he has a better answer than I do. Walter Isaacson, the award-winning biographer of Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, Ada Lovelace, Benjamin Franklin, was asked who of today's contemporary leaders would he put in the same category as his subjects? His answer, Jeff Bezos. Mm. I would argue the same thing, especially when it comes to communication skills. Who would I put in the same category as one of my first books on communication about Steve Jobs? And that's because Jeff Bezos was a dreamer who took a bold idea and transformed it from scratch into one of the world's most admired brands. Fortune Magazine always has a list of the world's most admired brands. Apple and Amazon usually buy for one and two. But think about this, especially if you're a small business owner. When Jeff Bezos came up with the idea of selling books online, he did not have a name for his company. His boss tried to talk him out of it, and most people said it couldn't be done. But he stuck to his vision. He was relentless about it. He was one of the first people to put the customer first. He said, if people are unfamiliar with what's called the internet, a lot of people didn't know what that was, we have to put, we have to prioritize the customer experience or we won't scale. We won't grow as quickly as we can. And along the way, Jeff Bezos pioneered communication and leadership strategies that fueled Amazon's astonishing growth. The reason why I chose Bezos and Amazon as a topic for this new book called The Bezos Blueprint is because I started speaking to CEOs of other companies and senior executives and startup entrepreneurs who had worked for Bezos. And they adopted many of the tactics and strategies that they learned from him to start their own companies. That's why it's a guide. And that's why I called it the blueprint. Bezos left a blueprint that others used to grow their, to grow and scale their companies. Brilliant. And look, we're going to get into the, 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 the nuts and bolts of that blueprint, uh, this afternoon. If anyone hasn't been aware. Uh, or certainly if anyone wasn't aware of Amazon before COVID, they're certainly aware of Amazon now. Yes. Uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, you can order a, a box of pens this evening and I will have them delivered through his prime service tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, he has just pioneered. There's so much innovation sits behind uh, Amazon in terms of their ability to deliver what they deliver in terms of that customer first ethos. You yep. spent the first third of the book on writing skills. Now, as writers, and you've alluded to 10 books, well done. Uh, as writers, our objectivity is, is somewhat compromised, but is writing a fundamental skill and, and how do we get better at it as leaders, given everything else that, that leaders of SMEs have to prioritize? Why should writing be one of those? I would argue that in a remote distributed world, uh, that writing is a fundamental skill mm -hmm. that will set you apart, get you ahead, especially if you can write in a way that is simple, clear, concise, understandable. Writing is such a fundamental skill at Amazon, few people know this, that most senior executives, most executives and managers are required to go through writing class. Because as you might know, Jeff Bezos famously banned PowerPoint in 2004. We can talk about that story in a moment, but he banned PowerPoint and replaced it with the written word. And he said, I want to see real paragraphs with sentences, nouns, and verbs, not just bullet points, because bullet points don't demonstrate that you've really thought through your plan or your idea. So writing is a critical skill at the world's, one of the world's largest, most technical company in the world. So if it works for Amazon, it's going to work for you. Whenever you send an email 
whenever you do a blog post or a memo uh, or even a presentation, most of the time it starts with the written word. I know that when I'm writing a presentation, I either put it on a Word document or in the notes of the PowerPoint. So it still starts with the written word somewhere. So writing is a very, very fundamental, especially when you are writing cross-functionally to different people in the organization who may not recognize the jargon uh, or different cultures. Uh, different languages. Writing becomes very uh, fundamental. And I, I learned some fa fascinating things uh, when I took a deep dive into the art of writing. First, I had to go back to school. And I realized that even though I have, had written 10 books, you could always get better. Writing is hard, which is why many people, many people who are listening might say to themselves, well, I'm not a good writer. You're not a good writer because writing is a hard skill to learn. And it's a skill. Like any skill, you can improve. You can get better. You may not ever be Hemingway, but you might be the best writer on your team or in your company. Jerry Seinfeld had a, had a joke once that pertained directly to this because he was asked about writing and writing jokes and how hard it is for him to do. And he said, writing is like pushing a wheelbarrow full of bricks up a hill in the mud. <laughs> in other words, it's supposed to be to hard. It's hard. And that's why I, I went back to writing school. I read, reread about 10 books on writing. I analyzed 50,000 words from Jeff Bezos and the Amazon shareholder letters which many executives told me are, role, are models of clear and concise writing. Mm -hmm. I also looked at Warren Buffett's writing because he too is a model of good writing. I interviewed around the world, I interviewed different uh, writing experts to see what can we learn from them? Because above all, I don't want to bore people. I don't want to trigger readers uh, who might have a bad experience or a bad memory about their writing class when they had to write a sentence on the chalkboard because they got it wrong. What are some of those fundamental writing techniques that Jeff Bezos uses to write a very clear shareholder letter and that anyone can adopt? So I have some very specific techniques and I'll, I'd like to give your listeners a few of them. Please. Simplicity. My, <laughs> I like your title, Simple Scaling. The, the first chapter of my writing section is Simple is the New Superpower. Yeah. If you can simplify your writing, it's not a reflection of dumbing down the content. It's a reflection of outsmarting the competition. Because great leaders who rise through the ranks, who climb the ladder, and who attract teams and employees and partners are good writers, but they're simple writers. So here's the trick, here's the trick. The more complex your topic, the simpler your language has to become. So what do you think is the average grade level, the best grade level to write or to, uh, to strive for if you want to reach a, a broad audience? Would it be writing for a high school level, college level, third grade level? What would it be? What do you think it is? I would hazard a guess that it should be at high school level so that anyone uh, you know, from the ages of 10 upwards can understand exactly what you're saying. I, I, I really subscribe to this. I have a little notepad behind beside me here and it, it says everything should be made as simple as possible, but not mm -hmm. simpler. And it's a quote from Einstein. So we're absolutely aligned, but share with me, is that, is that right? Eighth grade. It's... Anything written in eighth grade language, at least in the US, um, could be understood by 80% of Americans. And that's not too far off from different countries as well. So eighth, strive to write in eighth grade level. At Amazon, again, this is th the most advanced high-tech company in the world. And they, in their classes, 
recommend that people write at an eighth or ninth grade level. Mm -hmm. And what I found after analyzing 24 shareholder letters that Bezos wrote from 1997 to 2020 is that uh, his writing as, as Amazon became larger and more complex, the writing became simpler. Mm -hmm. It went from 10th college level, 10th grade level, most uh, seven of the last 10 shareholder letters were eighth and ninth grade levels. Yeah. So it's not, but it's not dumbing down the content. It's stripping the content of jargon that people may, that outsiders may not recognize. It's using the active voice more than the passive voice. It's using short, simple sentences to get your point across and not long convoluted sentences. So the sim the active voice is a very important concept in, uh, in the quality writing. And it simply means that the subject performs the action. Subject performs the action. So give us, so, give us, so give us an example. I will. Uh, let me make it really simple first. Subject performs the action. Um, and again, let's go back to writing class. The boy kicked the ball. The boy is the subject. Kicked is the verb. And the object of the action is the ball. It's shorter, simpler, tighter than the ball was kicked by the boy. And it's easier to understand. It's more instantly understandable. And that is the simplest sentence you can think about. The simplest one. Now, when you start writing and discussing more complex information, it's even better to stick to that active voice. Uh, let me give you some examples from my research at Amazon, where Jeff Bezos writes in the active voice. And then what I do is I take that example and I turn it into a passive voice and I make it, I, I take the verbs and I make them weak verbs. I'll explain that in a minute. So here's something that Jeff Bezos actually said. At Amazon, we obsess over the customer. Amazon obsesses over the customer. Subject, verb, object. Obsess is a good word, isn't it? He doesn't say, uh, at Amazon, you know, we tend to think of the customer because it's really important and, and the customer should come first. I learned from people who work directly with Jeff Bezos that he thinks very carefully about every word he chooses. So there is, a, he's intentional. We obsess over the customer. Isn't that preferable to, to saying, at Amazon, we tend to think that if we are more occupied with the customer and their experience, uh, we could probably do, be more successful over the long run. Yeah. Those are called at Amazon, they're weak or weasel words, tend to, sort of, kind of. No, think about the verbs that you're using and make them as strong as, as you can. Uh, missionaries make better products. That's another one of his mantras. Missionaries make better products than, mercen than um, mercenaries. It's, it's a metaphor that uh, Jeff Bezos has become famous for. A mercenary is someone who is just there to do a task. A missionary is someone who believes in the purpose of the company. And so he says, missionaries make better products. They care more. It's strong. It's assertive. It's subject, verb, object. Now imagine if I had said, I sort of think that missionaries tend to make better products because they seem to care more about the products they make. That's it's longer, it's passive, it's convoluted, short, simple, subject, verb, object, but pay attention to the verb too. Pay attention to the verbs you use, make them action verbs or active and action verbs. There's something in that as well, Carmine, just as you, you continue to expand on simplicity, yeah. there's real clarity in that message and there's real certainty. And I'm just tying it back certainty. to, to Good leadership. Word. Yeah. Yeah. And that to me, and it exudes confidence. So you're, there, there's a definiteness mm -hmm. to, to his speech. And what we always say is simple skills, complex feels. So, but we had never, right. 
we'd never aligned it or brought it back to to writing uh, because I didn't consider writing at this moment in time a fundamental skill uh, that undergirds the SME leaders, I suppose, toolkit in terms of their enablement to scale. And just before I leave that, there's something that our editor said when we were writing the book, again, aligned to your messaging, that now every word should fight for its place. Mm. That's a good that, point. That really resonates from, from what you're saying here in terms of the simplicity of the language. So, so anything else around simplicity? Yes. Let me end with Daniel Kahneman, who you've probably read, many of your listeners know. So Daniel Kahneman is the Nobel Prize winning psychologist and economist. He wrote a very famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. That is the, sort of the Bible of behavioral economics. Listen to this quote. If you care about being thought credible and intelligent, do not use complex language where simpler language will do. So people who are smart, who are confident, do tend to use language that is simpler and as you said, more assertive. But it takes work. So if you put in the work to keep your message simple, your simple message will become your superpower. That's why I titled chapter one, simple is the new superpower. Brilliant. And it takes confidence. You know this. It takes confidence to write simply, doesn't it? It, it absolutely does. And that's certainly been our experience in terms of writing our own book. Uh, but it, the, the act of writing really forces you to think about the substance of the message and the clarity and certainty you have around that message. And often, uh, as, as you have asserted and, and you've teased out in your book, what Jeff Bezos was brilliant was, was his use of metaphors in terms of actually um, amplifying certain messaging and, and, and points that he wanted to make. So, yes, moving from simplicity then, Carmine. Yes, let's move on. There are so many other uh, factors we can use. Uh, so let's, we can move on from writing. I think writing is a very important subject um, and it's the basis of everything, even a PowerPoint. But let's get back to storytelling because I have a chapter in the book that I think is very important, especially for small business owners. Everyone likes an origin story. And I'm sure you've used that term before and your listeners understand that. An origin story. Why did you start the company? Why did you, what problem does your product solve? Those are what are in entrepreneurial language in Silicon Valley, where I am. Those are called the origin stories. Mark Randolph, the co-founder of Netflix, who, by the way, endorsed the Bezos blueprint. And I was really honored that he did. has said, or, everyone craves an origin story. Netflix had a classic origin story. People want to understand in one story, what was the problem you were trying to solve? And it also introduces you to the characters. So uh, real briefly, probably I could do in 30 seconds, we all, many of us know the Netflix story where Mark Randolph and his friend at the time, Reed Hastings, uh, were driving to work one day. They, they carpooled to work and Reed was very upset because he was charged a late fee. $40 late fee at Blockbuster uh, for Apollo 13. Now notice that story has just a couple of details, a couple of elements that are always consistent. $40 and Apollo 13. Mark Randolph said, add a few details, just a couple of details, and it makes it more authentic, more real, kind of brings you there. And they turned to each other and Reed was very upset. So, so again, there's a problem that he's trying to solve. Most great companies and entrepreneurs solve something out of frustration. And his frustration was, how dare they charge me $40 for a late fee? It should be more like a gym membership where I pay one fee and I get all the time I want or all the movies I'd like. And so the, the concept for Netflix was born, making video rental easier. And because that mission was broad enough, they could start with VHS tapes and realize that that wouldn't work. And then a new technology came along called DVD. 
much easier to send and mail to your mailbox and then streaming. So they could not have conceived of streaming early on, but because their mission was to make video rentals work better and easier, it allowed them to come up with a structure. But Mark Randolph said, everybody wants to hear that story. And, and I am happy to deliver it to them because investors, employees, the media, they all want a nice story that's wrapped up in a ribbon. Okay, so we could talk about the origin story, but here's the secret. If you would like to be a better storyteller, think about wrapping your origin story in a three-act storytelling structure. So I devoted an entire chapter to this because Bezos does it beautifully. And I know he's doing it intentionally. He's a, he's a storyteller at heart. He understands. Three-act storytelling structure. It simply means that every Hollywood movie, almost every single Hollywood movie follows the structure, unless you're Quentin Tarantino. And he actually tries to throw people <laughs> off by messing up with the structure. But you're not Quentin Tarantino, so let's stick stick to the structure. Three-act structure, subject, or subject, we're, we're back to writing. Um, act one, act two, act three. Act one is the setup. Here's the status quo. In a movie, it's the first 30 minutes of a movie. That's where you introduce the characters, get to know who they are, their challenges, and uh, why they set off on the adventure. Act two is the challenge, confrontation. That's the, that's the middle hour of a two-hour movie, and that is where we introduce villains and hurdles and obstacles to the hero getting to their, uh, seeking their fortune. And of course, the last 30 minutes is the resolution. And in most movies, it's tied up in a bow and everybody lives happily ever after. That's called the three-act structure. Three-act structure is brilliant for communication as well and presentations. I know as a fact that Steve Jobs and Apple followed a three-act structure during their product announcements. Let's go back to the iPhone, 2007. If you watch the iPhone presentation on YouTube, the first few minutes of the iPhone presentation, he's not introducing the product because it's not about the product. We have to tell the story first. So it's the status quo. Here is your experience today on the current selection of mobile phones. It's a bad experience, isn't it? Yeah, you know, pretty soon he makes it sound so awful that you're nodding in agreement. You didn't even know you had a problem until Steve Jobs introduced it to you. And then he introduces the product. But it's not just the product. There were a lot of obstacles that they had to overcome in order to make a product that was leapfrogging the competition. And then act three is the demo. And now let me show you how it works and how it will make your life better. So act one, act two, act three. When Jeff Bezos articulates the origin story of Amazon, and he has done this publicly several times, it fits almost perfectly into that three-act structure. And Jeff Bezos does not begin from the day he came up with the idea of Amazon. When you ask him, how did Amazon get started? And he said, well, actually it started in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when I was born to a single mother who was still in high school, Jackie. And she, boy, she was determined and she had grit and determination. She was going to make this work. That, that's where I learned some of the values that I have today. Then he talked about working at his grandfather's cattle ranch and doing all of the veterinary type stuff that you would expect on a working ranch. And that too is where he learned grit, uh, tenacity, resilience, the values that would serve him well when he started his company. And then near the end of act one, there's what's called the inciting incident. Every romantic comedy has the inciting incident. That is the one scene where, uh, you know, Julia Roberts and Hugh Graham bump into each other and they spill orange juice on her blouse and conveniently his apartment is across the street. That's called the inciting incident. Without the incident, nothing else happens. There's no adventure. The inciting incident, when Jeff Bezos talks about the three-act story, is he always gets to it. And it's, it's the end of act one. He says, I was working at a hedge fund, not knowing exactly where my career would go. And I came across a startling statistic that the internet was growing at 
because he was a mathematician and a scientist, he understood intuitively that nothing grows 2,300% a year. That's compounding. And he understood just how powerful that could be. And then the adventure began and him and uh, McKinsey, his then wife jumped into a car and headed out West. That's a buddy trip in, in Hollywood. That's called a buddy road trip. And along the road trip, a lot of funny things happened, just like you would expect in some kind of road trip movie where things happen along the way. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, oh, act two is the, uh, the conflict. Oh, there's a lot of conflict. Amazon, he said, uh, success was not preordained because the stock fell 90%. The, the headlines in the papers were Amazon.bomb. We almost didn't make it. But because we were obsessed with the customer, we were able to grow and, and to succeed. And today, look at what Amazon does in your life. Look at how much money we're giving to climate change. Look at what we're doing here. He's try, he takes the company and then tries to position it into benefiting not just himself, which obviously has benefited him greatly, but also benefiting society at large. That's a perfect three-act structure. Yeah. What, what's remarkable to me is that whenever he tells the story, he uses the same scenes. I can predict what scene is coming up next. So he's already internalized the structure of the story. I, I know that he's going to talk about driving out west to Seattle, calling his lawyer uh, to sign the papers for a name for the company, and he didn't have a name. So he said, let's call it Abra, uh, like Kadabra, Kadabra, like Abra Kadabra. It's magic. And the, and the lawyer on the other end of the phone in 1994, reception wasn't great. And he said, Kadaver, is that what you want to name the company? And Jeff Bezos said, uh, I think I better rethink that. And a few months later, a few months later, he came up with Amazon. Why? He's thinking. He's always thinking ahead and he's thinking in metaphor. A, Amazon, when people had phone books back then, it's one of the first names in the phone book. And two, it's a metaphor for the Earth's largest river, Earth's largest selection. I, I love that. What it's a wonderful intentional, story. man. It's intentional. Yeah. yeah. And, and everything. And, 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 and this is so, there's, there's, a, there's quite a lot in there, but I want to tease out. Number one, I would like to offer a challenge, invite our listeners to actually take this three act structure mm -hmm. and, and uh, present this to a customer or certainly uh, identify a customer who will share the story of your own value proposition so mm. you can get real value from what you've just described. So I'm going to set yeah. that challenge for our listeners today. I've taken the time to listen. Uh, Good. And, and, Good. And, and that will be, uh, for me, very, very compelling whenever, whenever your proposition is actually spoken in the customer's words. Also, something in terms of the the uh, the leaders who are listening today, communicating on their vision, how important you mentioned the predictability of the scenes of, of, you know, Jeff Bezos's communication, how important is repetition in terms of communicating on the vision of the, the company, um, Carmine? Well, I will, uh, take a page from your book. Uh, your subtitle, I think was 10, 10 X. Ten, I'm yes. so, what was the exact Sim subtitle? Simple I read scaling, it? 10 principles to 10x your business. 10x your business. Okay. So I, re I read a research report that said most leaders under communicate their message by a factor of 10. It was a Harvard report. Yeah. So most, pe most leaders under communicate the mission. Jeff Bezos, I argue, over communicates the, me the message by a factor of 10. Jeff Bezos, early on in the first shareholder letter, began in, in Jeff Bezos' first shareholder letter in 1997, began to articulate that the customer would come first. And the customer was repeated uh, dozens of times in one letter. So now we know that he's really focused on the customer. And within one or two years, he transformed that idea. You could tell he was working on it into the mission 
Earth's most customer centric company. And so what I did in the book is I take speeches and interviews from 1997 to 2001. And I show you how in every presentation, he always brings it back to Amazon is, is Earth's most customer centric company. And that means we obsess over the customer and here's how. So if it's a new feature, or let's say he's introducing the Kindle, uh, what was the customer's problem? Uh, how do eBooks work better? Or Amazon Web Services, which is the giant cloud computing division. Every time he introduced a new concept, initiative, company, feature, he always brought it back to the mission. How does this reinforce the mission that Amazon is Earth's most customer-centric company? So when you ask me, how should leaders reinforce the mission and repeat the mission? I say repeat it by a factor of 10. Yeah. When you're tired of repeating the mission, repeat it more. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it from the, the world's uh, best communications expert, folks. So you cannot over communicate on your, on your purpose and your vision. Or it doesn't mean anything. But look, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. If it's just a mission statement that isn't core to who you are and doesn't really mean anything, you just feel as though you needed a mission statement. Yeah. Hey, that's okay. I've met a lot of people like that in a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. Put the mission statement on a frame and put it on the wall. Mm -hmm. But if it means something to you, and if you believe that it is the secret to growing and aligning people around a common mission, then you need to be the one to not only repeat it, but to share it to shout it as loud as you can. It better be the first words I see on your website, the first words in your presentation. And every time you have a meeting with teams uh, or partners or investors or customers, make sure that your content, your ideas reinforce the mission. Otherwise the mission doesn't mean anything. Yeah, completely agree. And and often I hear one of the greatest challenges to companies achieving scale is their ability to recruit great talent. And, and then I put back to them, well, how clear is your purpose? How compelling is it? How attached to you, connected to that purpose are you? And how clear is your vision? If I go onto your website now, do I know where you're going? Can I see you yeah. telling the story and giving people hope of what you're going to achieve when you get there? Because that's what people are going to be attracted to. So we're, we're absolutely aligned on that, Carmine. Coming back to Jeff, what, what else characterizes Jeff Bezos? as a wonderful communicator. So clearly a, a brilliant writer in terms of the simplicity of how he writes and the, the efficacy of his messaging, uh, his ability to tell stories. Anything else you wanna share with our listeners? He's the king of metaphor. Absolute king of metaphor. Uh, metaphor is an advanced communication concept, but it's easy to understand. And we speak in metaphor all the time. We just don't we don't know we are. Metaphor is simply taking something that's abstract and making it relevant and understandable by connecting it to something that is more familiar to people. Amazon. Why did he name Amazon? Amazon. It's a metaphor for world's largest something, yeah. world's largest selection, world's longest river. And he's thinking a metaphor from day one. Oh, let's talk about day one. What is day one? Day one is one of his, uh, Jeff Bezos's mantras at Amazon. There's a building that's called day one. The day, day one is not a real thing. Day one is a mindset. It's a growth mindset. All we, no matter how big we get, and he's already thinking big. He's got 10 people in a garage when he starts out and he's already saying day one. Day one is no matter how large you get, we're always going to think uh, from a beginner's mind. We're always going to have that entrepreneurial hunger and strive to excel and get better each and every day. It's a mindset. Day one. Walk into the headquarters in Seattle, and it's called the day one building. When Jeff Bezos moved buildings, he took the sign and they renamed another building that he moved into day one. So it's always day one. At the end of every shareholder letter, I think, be, I, I don't remember if it's 1997, but maybe 98. From then on, he always ended with, 
it's always day one. It's always day one. So again, that over communication of a mantra, of a yeah. mission, yeah. it's always day one. So that's a metaphor, but it's it's hard to recognize just how many metaphors startup entrepreneurs use today that came from Jeff Bezos. There's a popular one that's used in technology uh, called the flywheel, flywheels. So uh, am, you know, Amazon uses flywheels to power their growth. It's not a real flywheel. It's an idea that once you st you have a core uh, core business, once you have uh, related businesses around that core business that will continue to fuel the core business, it grows faster and faster and faster. I'm sure you've talked about it on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. Flywheel. Where yeah. do you think that came from? That didn't just appear. That came from Jim Collins, yeah, who wrote Good, good to Great. To great who was in a meeting with Jeff Bezos. And Jeff Bezos said, I like this flywheel concept. And he actually sketched it on a napkin. And that, that image is still on Amazon's website today because he took that one piece from a book. You probably wouldn't have heard about it. Bezos took it and pioneered it and turned it into something that could help grow Amazon. Have you ever heard of two pizza teams? Ever heard of that concept? Y yes, we had Sharish Nadkarni on recently, and he shared with me that that saying for the very first time. I loved it. Uh, so share with our listeners if they haven't uh, actually listened to that earlier episode. It's interesting. I wonder where is he from. I wonder if he knew that it came from Bezos. Yes. No. He he uh, attributed it to Amazon. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as Amazon was growing the teams were growing too large to deal with any one feature, any one product. And as everyone knows, all everyone who's listening today knows when a team gets too large, it becomes inefficient and bureaucratic and hierarchical and it's hard to communicate. And Jeff Bezos said, no, all of our teams need to be small. And one of his executives asked, well, Jeff, how small is small? And Jeff said, well, when we first started, I remember in the garage when we were working in Seattle and just packing boxes of books, we could, uh, we could do everything with uh, a team that could be fed with two large pizzas, <laughs> two large pizzas. Why don't we call it two pizza teams? And, so, <laughs> and it's, it was a, two pizza teams, two yeah. pizza teams, not only stuck for a long time, they started to change it. Because they realized that for some functions, two pizza teams didn't quite work, but that's okay. It, it worked for a while. And then they start um, single threaded leader is another one. I think two pizza teams were replaced by what are called single threaded leaders. So leaders who are hyper-focused just on one uh, feature or one team and one element. Mm -hmm. So two pizza teams became single threaded leaders. Single threaded leader or single threads is a computer term that uh, coders and product managers and computer scientists understood. But again, that was a metaphor that Jeff Bezos introduced and really popularized. So I've talked to executives who are former Amazonians, and, and this is really where I got most of the book, former Amazonians who had left Amazon to start their own companies. They took the lessons that Jeff Bezos left them. Yeah. They used it as a blueprint to build their own startups. And they're using all everything we just talked about. Instead of PowerPoints to pitch ideas, they're using narratives. They're putting an emphasis on writing. They're using two pizza teams. One person called it a 12 bagel team. One box of bagels. Okay, whatever you want. Another person called it a Roman tent. A, I said, what does that have to do with anything? He said, a Roman tent has eight people to the team. Oh, okay, great. But, but you, you see what they're doing. Yeah, it's they're, so using, they're using that simple metaphor and adapting it to their own companies. But that's the power of metaphor. Hmm. Think about if you have a complex idea that can fill a book and teams and team structures can fill a book, think about a simple metaphor to get it across. And once you do, and it resonates with people, use it all the time. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, 
two pizza teams is just so powerful. It's so simple, so powerful, but everybody can can get a vision in their head of what that means, as yep. opposed to saying, yeah, it's eight people. And then you invite conflict and say, well, why is it not 10 or 12 or six? And, you know, everybody <laughs> That's exactly just, right. You know, there's, there's no offense at all to two pizza teams. Everybody... Uh, yeah, I, I I get that. And then you, you start to concoct, uh, your mind starts to run with, yeah, I can see us yeah. in that garage, packing those boxes, aligned to the vision, you know, uh, at the end of a, of a hard day's uh, 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 mm -hmm. work, yeah. we can, you know, bring the pizza in. And, and that's all concocted from that simple two pizza teams from three. Oh, words. and the, so there are so more, you know, he, he planted seeds when people asked him early on, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, Amazon is not making uh, money or the first few six years did not make money. Uh, what's going on. We're planting seeds and yeah. some of those seeds are going to drop to the ground and, and they're, and they're not going to become anything, but one or two are going to grow into mighty oaks and once, and one of them did, it became Amazon Web Services that powered, essentially powered uh, the revenue and growth of the e-commerce business. So the, he's always, he's planting seeds. He's creating flywheels. He's building two pizza teams, uh, missionaries over mercenaries. That's, that's a metaphor, missionaries versus uh, mercenaries. He said, I love this quote, failure and invention are inseparable twins. Failure and invention are inseparable twins. So what is he doing? He's always thinking very intentionally about the language and the words he uses. Metaphors and analogies. It's an advanced concept. It takes a little thinking, little creativity, but boy, when you come up with the right one, it can be very powerful. And so powerful in relation to actually mitigating any challenge coming from shareholders about a, a failure that has happened within the business. He's, he's heading that off straight away. And, and his writing is really powerful. And I invite our listeners, uh, when you get an opportunity to obviously pick up Carmine's book, but uh, to get a, to get an insight of Jeff Bezos's writing straight away, go onto the internet and, and read Jeff Bezos's resignation letter. It's mm. just so powerful. Carmine, what in that letter for you characterizes the man that is, that is Jeff Bezos and his brilliance as a communicator. Okay. The letter that you're referring to is, uh, the last email memo that he sent out when he announced that Andy Jassy, who is the former CEO of AWS, will replace him as, a C, as CEO. So 27, I wrote a chapter on this. I called it 27 years of innovation in 620 words. So simplicity is an act of selection. It is not an act of compression. Don't try to put everything you know in an email, in a memo, in a presentation. Select what your audience needs to know. When you have a customer meeting, they don't need to know everything about your product or the technology or your service. They just need to know three or four things that apply to them. And that's why Bezos can write 27 years of innovation in an email of 620 words. And even in the, I'm looking at the letter now, one of the first things he said, the first sentence is they are successful. They were successful because they focused like a laser on the customer. So he's coming right back to the mission. We obsess over the customer. He said, that is fundamental. That's why we've succeeded. Just in terms of his writing, uh, before we move to the close, I want to be respectful of your time. He, you alluded to it earlier, he wrote a letter for his 20th anniversary in 2017, underneath which he included a letter that he wrote to his shareholders in 1997, mm -hmm. which I would advise everyone to read his, his writing, you know, as we've mentioned, is clearly an art form. And this letter, he told a story about perfect handstands. He wrote... A close friend recently decided to learn to do a perfect freestanding handstand. No leaning against a wall, not for just a few seconds. Instagram, good. 
She decided to start her journey by taking a handstand workshop at her yoga studio. She then practiced for a while but wasn't getting the results she wanted, so she hired a handstand coach. Yes, I know what you're thinking, but evidently this is an actual thing that exists. In this very first lesson, the coach gave her some wonderful advice. Most people, he said, think that if they work hard, they should be able to master a handstand in about two weeks. The reality is that it takes about six months of daily practice. If you think you should be able to do it in two weeks, you're just going to end up quitting. Unrealistic beliefs and scope often hidden and undiscussed kill high standards. To achieve high standards yourself or as part of a team, you need to form and proactively communicate realistic beliefs about how hard something is going to be, something this coach understood well. Just the, the writing is masterful uh, in that piece alone. But something I want to tease out, Carmine, before we move into the close, I mean, what he's alluding to there is the importance of business leaders as they continue to scale, maintaining high standards. Mm, right. Uh, you know, how do we today advise our listeners to maintain high standards through their communication and also manage realistic expectations? That's exact. The uh, handstand metaphor, that's a metaphor. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the handstand metaphor is also referring to how hard it is to scale and how hard it is to uh, do good writing as well, because that was part of the letter in which he talked about banning PowerPoint and replacing it with uh, narratives and writing. You think it's easy, writing especially, looks easy, but it's kind of like doing a handstand. It, it looks easy, but it takes weeks, months of practice. And so I think that this idea of maintaining excellence in everything you do is something that few people do well, but as a growth leader who wants to align and scale, it is imperative that you demonstrate the action that you want people to copy. And that's always having exceptionally high standards for everything you do, whether it's a design on a website or the words you choose or a presentation. People will rise to the level of the leader in which they're surrounded by. So it really, I, I've noticed this in every company I, I've had the opportunity to coach. It always starts with a leader. So let me end with an observation about Richard Branson, or Richard Branson, who I, I just wrote about, uh, Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos, when I asked, I've been researching Bezos for like three years now. When I asked 10 people, for their opinion on Jeff Bezos, and everyone has an opinion. They, they all have a strong opinion. They haven't met him, but they have a strong opinion about Bezos, and they're all over the map. When you speak to 10 people who have worked side by side with Bezos, they all have almost exactly the same opinion. In fact, they use the same words. Visionary, committed to excellence, he raised the bar. He was the one who raised the bar and made people better. Sometimes they were frustrated at the time because he, was, he had such a commitment and a discipline for everything to be excellent. But then they realized that they became better at their job. They became better leaders because they were exposed to someone who was committed to excellence. So they always use the word visionary. They always use the word excellence. And to a person, every single person who I interviewed, who worked side by side with Bezos, always concludes with the same line. I never traded for the world. That's what I wanted to understand. Why? Why wouldn't you trade it? What did you learn? That's why I wrote the Bezos blueprint. Carmine, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. It would be remiss of me before we move into the close. Given the challenges of the hybrid workplace today, yes. you know, we've, we've 
we've moved away in many respects from email and writing or certainly I'm speaking for myself here. <laughs> My emails are becoming more clipped as the, as the days go on. We've yes. so many channels now by which we communicate. We have WhatsApp, we have uh, Slack, we have Microsoft teams, yeah. uh, you know, we, we have email. How should leaders communicate effectively in this now new environment? Well, it's all writing. It all comes down to writing and memos and emails become even more important when you're sending them across teams, across different time zones, different cultures, different languages. So I think the simplicity is a very important concept, but I'll give you a technique that I learned from Amazon and that I also learned from the military. Uh, I'm often asked to speak at uh, military bases around the country and they all do the same thing. They call it bluff. Bottom line up front. You may have heard of it. Bottom <laughs> line up front. That's a military thing. It's a, it came from the U.S. Army originally, from what I've, what I've researched. When you send an email, when you send a memo, what is the bottom line? Put it up top. Don't wait for me to get through the entire email before I figure out what the purpose is. <laughs> bottom line up front. When I started researching Amazon, one of the writing coaches said, oh, we have a technique that works really well, Carmine, especially when it comes to emails. I said, what, what is it? Bottom line on top, bottom line on top. It's the same thing. Every email has to have one sentence bolded. Here's what the email is about and here's why it's coming to you. Yeah. Then you can decide, do I need to read it now or can I set it aside for later or do I need to take action on it now? What's funny is that, uh, a high tech company like Amazon thinks they came up with it. I didn't have the heart to tell them it goes back to the 1970s in the U.S. Army. But if you want to take credit, go for it. <laughs> I've, same never, principle. I've never heard of Bluff. What a, what a brilliant practical takeaway for our listeners today. Carmine, I always close by asking our guests, given the incredible career that you've had the uh, the 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 list of high profile individuals transcending so many disciplines who you've worked with what would you like to share with our listeners today in terms of three timeless takeaways three timeless takeaways first reimagine the way you see yourself as a leader communicator public speaking writing, communication, those are skills. And like any skill, you can improve. Mm. If you put in the time, do the reps, put in your practice. So reimagine the way you see yourself. Regardless of your title, you are the chief storytelling mm. officer for your brand. Second, this is the golden age of communication. Take advantage of it. You can listen to these podcasts where Brendan interviews all these wonderful uh, experts and authors to help you scale your business. You can watch TED Talks for free. Some of the world's best speakers for free at your fingertips. Take advantage of the golden age of communication. And third and finally, an entire chapter in my book, read more than the average person. Read books that are maybe complementary and relevant to your field. If you're an entrepreneur, you can be inspired by the biographies of other entrepreneurs and understand the challenges that they've gone through. Every single leader, including Jeff Bezos, who I have interviewed uh, or who is one of the most admired people in their company are more often than not people who read significantly more than the average person. So read more books because it'll make you wiser and also more interesting. You'll be a more interesting communicator and it'll help you stand out. Such wonderful advice. Uh, it's often said smart people learn from their own mistakes. Really smart people learn from the mistakes of others who have captured it in their books. And you have some wonderful books. Uh, the certainly uh, Talk Like Ted has been a really important book for me as I continue on my keynote right. speaking journey. So thank you for that. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful book. I'm really looking forward to, to the, the Bezos blueprint. If uh, people want to connect with you directly, uh, Carmine, where best to reach you? 
you can learn more about the book and you can even get a uh, free uh, workbooks and videos for anyone who orders a copy of the Bezos Blueprint by visiting my website, CarmineGallo.com. So if you can remember a good Italian name like Carmine Gallo, <laughs> you can find me. Uh, and the books are available in the UK and in the US simultaneously and on ebook and on Audible, uh, where I voice the book myself. So, but if you'd like to look me up, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm great on LinkedIn, Carmine Gallo. I think I'm the only one in California uh, <laughs> or just go to CarmineGallo.com. And I'd love to see you on TikTok too. I'm, I'm very active on TikTok, Carmine Gallo speaker. Ah, well, look, just you mentioned TikTok. We've been chatting off air. It would be again, remiss of me not to, to, uh, to pick up what is a very new communication channel, certainly from a business perspective. I would love to, to, um, to get an understanding of, of your experience of TikTok, is that, is that a channel where we should be as business leaders or should we, you know, as the perception is, should we leave that to the kids? Should we leave that? Is that a, a, a non-professional channel or should we definitely be on there? What's your experience of it so far, Carmine? Yeah, my, my experience with TikTok is uh, you should be on there ASAP because it seems as though it's taking the same arc as uh, Instagram and, and other social media sites where maybe it began as just uh, photos and, or short videos uh, and it skewed younger to now it's this, uh, the third largest search engine behind Google, YouTube, and now it's TikTok. Yeah. So if this new community, that's a growing community and they're skewing a little older all the time, if they are using TikTok to look up how to's and helpful subjects, then you should be there. And it's interesting to me that some of the people who are, who go viral on TikTok or who give TikTok uh, tips and tricks on how to create better videos, they're going back to communication skills that are 2000 years old. Uh, they're going back to the communication skills I wrote in Talk Like Ted or in the Bezos Blueprint, which is grab people's attention, grab their attention early, make your instruction simple and concise. That's well, not new to TikTok. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to this, uh, this extract going viral on TikTok. It's a channel that we've, we've only recently tested. And I have to say from a podcast perspective, it's been incredibly successful. Mm. Uh, but that's, that's having a growth mindset. It, all, always learning from different communicators. I, I don't care how I learn from everybody. I don't care how old you are, what uh, what language you speak, what category you're in. I can learn something from you. And I'm learning a lot from these TikTokers who I think a lot of adults should learn from. Adults who give these really long, boring pre uh, PowerPoint presentations. Why don't you watch TikTok? Because they could grab the good ones, grab your attention in two seconds. How do they do that? Maybe you should do more of that when you deliver a PowerPoint. Yeah. Brilliant advice. So look, folks, if you haven't been on TikTok yet, get on to TikTok is, is the advice. And uh, certainly we're on there. Um, it's a fascinating channel. And Carmine, you've left us with a reminder of the very first principle of scaling from our 10 principle scale X framework, Psyche, which is all about having a growth mindset. So once again, look, I want to thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I can't believe uh, the, 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 the time has flown today. Uh, I wish you all the very best with the Bezos blueprint and everything you're doing. You put so much value out into the world. I want to acknowledge that and, and thank you once again, Carmine. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.